You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org. Welcome back uh, to the second part of our program today. One of my favorite essays of uh, James Buchanan's is his Positive Economics, Welfare Economics, and Political Economy, uh, published in the Journal of Law and Economics in 1959. Um, In that essay, Buchanan does the careful dance, or as Mike so eloquently described before, this kind of tension um, that he does between social and and, and the social and policy sciences, between accepting the discipline of a positive science, the art of applying the lessons of that science to questions of public policy, and acknowledging the philosophical issues associated with any discussion of the appropriate role of government in society. Buchanan was a strange mix of a technical economist, a political economist, and a social philosopher. You can go even further and actually argue that he was a moral philosopher in the tradition of Adam Smith in an age of economic scientism. Economic scientism was at its peak precisely at the time that Buchanan was writing against um, this uh, development of economics. Um, you can see this even in his, one of his very first essays, um, which is on the pure theory of government expenditure, in which he's attacking the idea of a fiscal brain, um, in which you have, as later would be the case, a stable social welfare function over which a benevolent social planner chooses the optimal tax um, and subsidy scheme or whatever, Buchanan was agitating against that from the very beginning of his career. Um, we have a seminar room in our dedicated space in Mason Hall where we hold most of our dissertation defenses for our graduate students. And on the wall is a quote from Buchanan that he used to describe the Thomas Jefferson Center um, at UVA back in the late 1950s. And I'm going to quote uh, at length from it right now uh, that what we're about is striving to carry on the honorable tradition of political economy, the study of what makes for a good society. Political economists stress the technical economic principles that one must understand in order to assess alternative arrangements for promoting peaceful cooperation and productive specialization among free men. Yet political economists go further um, and frankly try to bring out into the open the philosophical issues that necessarily underlie all discussions of the appropriate functions of government and all proposed economic policy me- measures. So we take this as our educational mission at the Hayek program, and thus the PPE nature of our program, even for ourselves as researchers and educators and also for our graduate students. Um, And then also, this is the nature of the panel that we put together today with three leading thinkers in the world, in the fields of economics, politics, and philosophy, discussing the implications of the style of work and the kind of questions that Buchanan uh, wanted to ask um, and was critical at initiating in such diverse fields in the second half of the 20th century as law, politics, sociology, history, economics, and philosophy. Their bios are all in our program, so I'm not going to just repeat what's in the program. Um, So instead, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce our distinguished panelists um, as I would like, okay? So we're going to do philosophy, politics, economics, just like the PPE. So it's going to (laughs) go Dave Schmitz, Barry Weingast, and then Luigi Zangales. Um, And uh, so Dave Schmitz is the Kendrick Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Arizona. He is the author of numerous books, including Rational Choice and Moral Agency, and also, more recently, The Elements of Justice. Uh, Dave is currently the editor of Social Philosophy and Policy, and he runs the Freedom Center at the University of Arizona. Um, Barry Weingast is uh, currently the Jack and uh, Pritzker Distinguished Visitor at the Northwestern School of Law, Um, but his uh, normal job (laughs) is the Krebs uh, Family Professor um, in the Department of Political Science at Stanford University. He is the author of Violence and Social Orders and the editor of a a book called Preferences and Situations. I figured that people don't always point that book out, but 
I wanted to point it out because for those of you who are graduate students and might take my class in the spring, you're going to have to read it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's about the intersection of rational choice, institutionalism, and historical institutionalism. And uh, I think that that's extremely uh, uh, relevant for the kind of work that we've been talking about. Bowery's work has made fundamental contributions uh, to our understanding of the process of economic and political development. Uh, legal institutions and democracy, and more recently has turned his attention to working through our understanding of Adam Smith's contributions to the institutional infrastructure required for, uh, uh, to realize the gains from specialization and trade, and peaceful cooperation, I should add. Uh, Luigi Zangales is the McCormick Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago. He is the author, with Raghu Rajan, of Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists, and more recently, a people's capitalism. As I mentioned to Luigi on the way over here, I tell everyone that I possibly can, so I'm going to tell you again, this is the book you should read about inequality in America, not Thomas Piketty. All right? Put down the Piketty, pick up the Zengalis. <laughs> There's a reason. It's not in the inherent laws of capitalism, supposedly discovered, but instead in the institutional infrastructure and uh, institutional sclerosis that we have in our society that has created the problems in, in American society that we're seeing. And Luigi identifies those probably better than anyone uh, else in the world. Uh, his work has explored how legal and regulatory environments impact the operation of publicly uh, traded companies and financial markets in general. So now we'll hear from the panelists, uh, roughly 20 minutes each, and then uh, have some interaction with them and then open it up for Q&A. Um, and so as I said, we're going to go down the line, Dave, then Barry, and then Luigi. Um, and so with that, please uh, welcome uh, Dave Schmitz. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for uh, y'all for having uh, having me out. It's uh, uh, it's I'm honored to be here, but I'm also just thrilled that this kind of event is uh, is possible at all. James Buchanan worked in a contractarian tradition that we date back to Thomas Hobbes around 400 years ago. To Hobbes, human action orbits around. Uh, goal of personal survival. So we call Hobbes an egoist in our introductory courses, but here's the rest of the story. To Hobbes, we're born at the center of our universe, and so we have an egocentric bias. So our egocentrism fosters what? Enlightened self-interest? No, vanity. So we have a higher opinion of ourselves than the people around us to do, which is a never-ending irritation, that's, that's, that's what starts the war. We spend our lives retaliating against those whose universe does not revolve around us, and everyone thinks somebody else fired the first shot. So as Mike said, as a first approximation, first, first pass at the essence of, the starting essence anyway of public choice theory is that it's not that people are egoists, but that people who run courts and legislatures are just like people who run businesses and households. Some people want money. Some want power. But everyone who spends a lifetime working to acquire power wants power for something. Maybe they're pursuing enlightened self-interest, but it's usually more complicated. Sometimes it's worse. Uh, maybe sometimes it's better. Between Hobbes and Buchanan, there was a Scottish Enlightenment whose main figures were David Hume and Adam Smith. So Smith put also a pretty complex but somewhat gentler spin on moral psychology, positing a drive to be esteemed. But beyond that, something beyond that, much beyond that actually, a drive to be genuinely worthy of, uh, of esteem. So when Lakachman says something like, well, it's like, it's as if Buchanan never, I mean, we get this all kind, a bunch, we get this all the time. It's as if we never read Adam Smith. We don't realize he wrote two books. No, it's as if, it's as if you never read us. Uh, it's as if you didn't read Buchanan. You assume that he's a defender of egoism. 
Uh, not so, not the case. So a drive to be genuinely worthy of esteem. We're social animals. We have a propensity to truck and barter. What drives us to truck and barter isn't simply the money, generally speaking, not mainly the money. The truth is more profound, a lot more interesting than that. What drives us to truck and barter is our nature as social animals. We truck and barter in order to make a place for ourselves in a community so that we can lay down for that last time knowing it was good that we were here, knowing that we made the world a better place. For Scottish Enlightenment philosophers, the mid-1700s, that was a pretty heady time. Europe had never seen uh, a better opportunity, maybe a less hopeless opportunity, I should say, to make progress. Hume and Smith, following Galileo and Francis Bacon, then Newton, were on a quest to apply the uh, experimental method to what they called the moral sciences. Among philosophers, that observation-based approach, that Scottish approach, was called empiricism. By the mid-1800s, John Stuart Mill was taking that approach to its logical limit. So in a series of works culminating in 1848 with the principles of political economy, oh, there, I, I did an experiment, it worked. <laughs> All right. Principles of political economy, Mill separated the questions of production of goods from the question of distribution. That's what you do when you're wanting to be a tough-minded science and scientist and analytically rigorous. If two things can be separated, you separate them. It's also true that Mill thought at that time, even though the telegraph had just been invented, he thought that the humanity had largely uh, exhausted the frontier of technological progress. After all, how much faster are horses going to go? Uh, but the, you know, the future, I don't know. Uh, I mean, even at the time, people said, what are you talking about? But anyway, uh, his idea was that the future was going to be an economic steady state. There wouldn't be a whole lot more news on the production side. Human progress would come via better distribution, not rising productivity, which made distribution the central topic. So today, we hardly remember Mill pressing that distinction, and we can hardly imagine not seeing production and distribution as separate topics. But sometimes what seems to be two things is actually one thing. It's like the morning star and the evening star, and when you separate them, you end up being badly misled. Mill's distinction helped to cut philosophy off from the scientific study of what makes some societies more productive than others. And since philosophy and political economy came apart, and by the end of the century, political science and government would be separate from economics, but at that time, they were still together. But since philosophy and political economy came apart, we've portrayed what society produces as a pie. Philosophy departments left to these emerging economics departments the question of what produces the pie. What's left to philosophers, which we call justice, is a question about dividing the pie. That's what derailed philosophy. There was a time when we knew that justice isn't about pie, it's about bakers. In philosophy, it's like this. We look at a snapshot of a busy intersection. We see how arbitrary it is that some of those people have green lights and others have red lights. And if we focus exclusively on the snapshot, if we say, look, what it takes to manage traffic, the social scientists do that. If you're, like, if you're not up to the standards of philosophy, do social science, right? Do that. Uh, you, you study what, what manages traffic. We're working on justice. And if we focus on that, if it's exclusively a snapshot, if justice is exclusively a snapshot, then it seems pretty obvious, I guess, uh, in an ideally just world, everyone would have a green light at the same time. Now consider not only how abstract that is, but what a distortion it is to imagine a pie sitting there passively waiting for us to decide how to slice it. 
If we set aside everything we've learned about the terms of engagement under which bakers are better off together, then there's no testable answer to the question of how to divide the pie. We know justice, and we'll tell our introductory students, we know justice isn't just a matter of opinion, but that's what we made it look like when we started treating philosophy as outside the realm of empirical test. So Human Smith understood, as did Buchanan, that economic justice pertains to a process, not an outcome. The pie is a metaphor for lifetimes of work. Justice is about respecting lifetimes of work. To Hume, we assess patterns of mutual expectation. It's not, doesn't have the cartoon conservative implication that you think. Not all conventions command respect. But to Hume, the ones that do are the ones that are useful or agreeable to self or to others. And to Smith, we assess conventions in terms of how they affect the wealth of nations. How do wealthier societies manage commercial traffic? What are the documented consequences of alternative trade policies? So their questions mattered, and their questions had testable answers. By the mid-1900s, when Buchanan was starting out, philosophy had painted itself into a corner. It had taken that distinction of Mills um, to uh, its logical conclusion, and the, uh, the division of labor among you know, academic fields was, uh, was tracking it. Philosophers were analyzing the meanings of words as used in ordinary language, and that is worthwhile to a point, but still, moral and social philosophy were in bad shape. So that's one story about how philosophy came to be what it is today, isolated and marginalized as the social science departments emerged in the 1800s. Was Mill really that pivotal I'm not sure that there's any such thing as an unequivocal historical record. Hume taught us correlations, one thing, causations, another. So let me mention three other key events that also correlate with philosophy's marginalization. The first event is not long after Mill separated production and distribution, Henry Sidgwick separated... Um, egoism from utilitarianism and developed them into what he thought of as two uh, separate, irreconcilable methods of ethics. Before that, utilitarianism was about the reality of which policies foster the wealth of nations. So what actually drives people was at the center of utilitarian analysis. It wasn't something to set aside as of interest only to egoists. Uh, another thing, after Mill, over a process of a century, utilitarianism eventually became a philosophy that's officially about maximizing, that's how you think of it, but take a look. It's all about distributing. Utilitarianism's one and only moral duty. Check, is there any money in your pocket? If so, then put that money to where it'll do more good. Keep giving until either there's nothing left or there's no one left who needs it more than you do. So what's missing? No talk about the utility of entrepreneurship or of creativity or of productivity. All that is left is the utility of distributing opportunities to consume, um, opportunities to be a stomach. Before Mill, Utilitarians worked on the nature and sources of the wealth of nations. They studied property rights and other tools of commercial traffic management. What happened? Third change. Oh. Yeah, and that's where we're at today, kind of. We're getting past that now, but, uh, but Peter Singer, the apex of that. 1903, another towering uh, philosopher, G.E. Moore, publishes Principia Ethica and transforms the is-ought problem into one of moral philosophy's core puzzles. Uh, the puzzle continues to stump us to this day. Uh, problem is, 
Deductive logic can't get us from premises about what is the case to conclusions about what ought to be done. David Hume, as early as the mid-1700s, he understood the problem. Some say Hume invented it. He certainly drew our attention to it. But the thing is that Hume had a genius for identifying skeptical problems of all kinds, and he did not treat the is ought problem as unique. Some, you know, special debunking of ethics, which is how we treat it today. Hume was using the is ought problem to model a key feature of scientific reasoning. Scientific reasoning is a process of collecting data, then formulating hypotheses about what could make the data look like that. We don't exactly deduce what explains the data, neither do we directly observe causation. Instead, we jump to a conclusion about what would explain the data, then we test our theory by seeing how well it predicts what we will observe under controlled experimental conditions. So in rough essence, that's what we call the scientific method. Hume understood the is ought problem tells us something about the nature of science. Namely, science doesn't generate new knowledge by deduction. So Hume thus got moral science on a par with natural science. And then we missed his point. It's part of human nature. Guess, take risks, make mistakes, and learn fast. Proof and evidence are related, but they're distinct. Proof is rare. Evidence is everywhere. We look at facts and see reasons. We derive reasons from facts 100 times a day, but seldom by deducing. We jump to conclusions. Doesn't make us better philosophers, but it's how we survive. Does that mean facts aren't relevant? No. You figured this out when you were four, right? Remember that time? There was only one time when you put your hand on the hot plate, right? You observe your hand frying. You leap to the conclusion, it's time to move that hand, right? You don't have to repeat that experiment. You never did. Um, your conclusion is not the, not the outcome of a valid deduction, but neither is it a mistake. Lessons not that there's no truth about how to live, but that deductive logic is not what connects factual premises to conclusions about how we ought to live. Of course we make mistakes. The conclusions we jump to, that scientists jump to, are often mistaken. What's crucial is not avoiding mistakes so much as avoiding being the last to, look, to admit mistakes. Being quick to admit mistakes, so quick to learn, drives human progress. So I said public choice is core insight is that people who occupy political office are the same as everyone else. No better, no worse. In one respect, maybe they're worse. Uh, when they see their hand on fire, they move that hand. When they see your hand on that fire, they convene a committee to discuss how to blame the uh, opposition party. Um, so when you're paying for mistakes with other people's money, the market discipline just isn't there. Uh, you know, the cost and choice, it just isn't there. So sometimes politicians are indeed the last to learn from mistakes. Buchanan saw that fact of life as bearing on where we should want to go from here. Was he jumping to conclusions? Maybe, but he wasn't mistaken. The core insight of public choice leaves political philosophy with a core challenge. There's a difference between the stage of formulating rules and the stage of playing within the rules, and yet, the people, the hell of the human condition is people formulating the rules are themselves players. What makes some players want to be referees? Once they become referees, what makes them want to aim at letting the players play rather than cooperating with the, in their mind, other players, which means the other referees, to turn the game into a rent-seeking extravaganza for referees? What makes them want to represent instead? That's the mind-boggling central problem that Buchanan salvaged from the Scottish Enlightenment and Hobbesian contractarianism and I guess the American founding as well. That problem is reanimating political philosophy today, uh, which I think is it's a historic opportunity, maybe the least hopeless moment since the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, we're rewriting the whole field, and I am really excited about it. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I started out in economics. No political science department would have me at the time that I began. Uh, luckily, economists would. Uh, uh, and at the time, I was enamored by Buchanan's work and read everything I could, uh, you know, as I'm sure some of you have. And it was just an exciting time, and it has affected me uh, and my thinking uh, all this time. And I want to tell you a little bit about how that works. Uh, not, not so much my work, but how, how, how Jim's work fits together uh, in, in, with uh, over a 30 or 40 year period. So I want to talk a little bit about ja uh, 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 Buchanan's constitutional political economy. And one of the key questions he asks again and again and again in very different ways and in very different circumstances or pap papers or books, we live, how do people interact in an orderly manner? And he says, we live together because social organization provides the, an efficient means of achieving our individual objectives, not because society offers us a means of arriving at some transcendent, transcendental common bliss. It's such a Buchanan phrase. Uh, that's a quote from Limits of, Li Limits of Liberty. So here's another quote. If an exchange rather than a maximizing paradigm is taken in, to be descriptive of the inclusive research program for this discipline, then economics involves an inquiry into cooperative arrangements. So there's the point that uh, 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 Mike was making uh, about cooperation rather than, rather than uh, exchange. Into cooperative arrangements for human interaction, extending from the simplest of two-person, two-good trading processes through the most complex quasi-constitutional arrangements for multinational or organizations uh, from a paper called Domain of Constitutional Political Economy. So the, the situations in which humans interact are almost endless. We know this. We're all familiar with this. I made a list of a few things. The first item on the list is lines. They're ubiquitous. Uh, another favorite of Buchanan's was, of course, academic discourse. It came up in Mike's talk earlier today, the idea that uh, 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 academic discourse, discourse in general, was facilitated by the rule, the idea that, that one person speaks at a time, and that, that that nature of ordered anarchy, as he called it, would, would uh, 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 disappear into anarchy if people failed to follow the rule. And of course, he was particularly aghast at situations where people did fail to follow the rule. Um, and so he's interested then in cooperation, uh, in ordered anarchy in many places, but also you know, modern politics and economics. So here are some critical ideas. When is decentralization, decentralized exchange adequate? This is a central question of him because it had to do with the limits, the boundaries between the public and the private. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna make this very simple. So when is decentralized exchange adequate? It's when property rights are w well established and there's an abs absence of public good problems. So this implies, that it, when, this, uh, when these conditions are met, it implies that problems with decentralized exchange, if either of the two conditions fail. So some form of public decision making then is necessary and Buchanan spent a gr great deal of his professional life trying to figure out what those uh, public institutions should look like, those that would minimize the costs on liberty uh, 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 to a minimum. And of course, th this goes all the way back to the beginning with the calculus of consent. And uh, its famous discussion about the advantages of um, majority rule versus unanimity, something again that Mike touched on. So Buchanan also worried about a deeper problem, and that's something that I want to talk a little bit more, more about. So after Studying the problem of enforcing rights against the encroachment by others, uh, Buchanan observes, it becomes much more difficult to think of the means through which individuals can enforce and protect their rights from unlawful acts on behalf of the collectivity itself. How can Leviathan be chained? So the idea here is, um, is, is government itself is a form of power and action, and how do we as citizens prevent uh, or design a constitution uh, uh, that has the capability of preventing these kind of unlawful acts. Well, of course, this has something to do with the predatory state. It goes under many names. Uh, in the uh, 17th and 18th century, it was called the arbitrary abuse of power, and this is a problem uh, uh, at which Locke, Montesquieu, Smith, and Madison all start. 
That is, they're all concerned about this kind of uh, uh, arbitrary action, a predatory state, and they want to know how it is and whether or not it is possible to create something that uh, uh, can prevent this kind of predatory state. Uh, Hobbes was also equally interested in this. His answer was just the opposite, though. His answer was that, no, it is not possible to do anything, so get, get used to it. I have a quote here from Adam Smith. So what's the economic problem of arbitrary abuse of power? Uh, well, Adam Smith says <clears throat> in The Wealth of Nations, men in this defenseless state naturally content themselves with their necessary subsistence, but to acquire more might only tempt the injustice of their oppressors. So in other words, in a, in a world where there's a lot of predation, both private and public, uh, 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 Husbanding your resources, uh, building capital, improving the land and the like, makes you stand out. And people that stand out in that sense are targets. So this rages, uh, 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 Buchanan says, an age-old problem for which there's no full satisfactory answer. Um, the solution we know is in elements of the solution we know. That is, how do we protect against arbitrary abuse of power by the government? Uh, uh, the, the, the solution is the rule of law, impose the rule of law. Uh, that is, general laws, uh, people are equal before the laws, uh, laws are known in advance, laws are stable, those kind of rules. Uh, but of course, that's just a statement of the solution. That's not a statement of how one arrives at the solution and arriving at the solution in the sense of how does a political system sustain uh, uh, the rule of law then becomes one of the big issues. So one of the questions I want to ask is, why have so few states followed anything like Buchanan's contractual program? Uh, at best, 25 or 30 countries today. And I'm going to argue the answer is violence. I'm going to argue that violence is, is underappreciated in this world. Uh, and especially, it's one of the most important margins missing from economics, not the economics that we apply to the United States uh, and the like, where that's relatively rare, but the economics of the developing world. If we think about Mexico, Mexico is one of the um, uh, uh, richer developing countries. Uh, uh, think about the multiple sources of violence outside of the state. So we have the drug lords, of course. Uh, there are labor unions uh, uh, who have at times shut down states uh, and cities. Uh, there are the uh, uh, Chiapas is, is, a, is another one. And so there are multiple sources of violence. It's not like there's a pol consolidated political control over violence. And that creates a very different kind of problem to be solved. And I want to argue it transforms the nature of the, the, the development problem. So um, one of the problems, then, that we have to worry about is violence by organized groups. Now, Buchanan does talk about violence. He has that story in The Limits of Liberty and uses variants on it elsewhere about how uh, everybody, uh, when he go stops at the roadside fruit stand, uh, everybody agrees that the fruit, that the fruit stand is the, uh, owned by the fruit uh, uh, purveyor, and everyone agrees that the money in his pocket is, in fact, his. Uh, and he does talk about violence at that level, but it's not organized violence. Uh, he, he does model violence as a prisoner's dilemma, as if two neighbors are trying to des each decide whether or not to use violence to, to, to put in effort to grow their crops or to use violence to steal the crops of their neighbor. But that's small change by, you know, violence, and, and it's a little too simple, I think. So, um, and in particular, this, this approach misses what uh, I think of as another type uh, of violence, and that's namely organized violence. So we can think about these in many senses. Uh, bands of shepherds that overwhelm the, the Roman Empire uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, on the order of 1,500 years ago. Olson's stationary bandits uh, fit here, uh, uh, roving bandits and stationary bandits, uh, North's neoclassical theory of the state, and of course Brennan and Buchanan's own um, model of the predatory state uh, uh, in their 1980 book uh, uh, in which they called it Leviathan, a tax, a tax machine that was seeking to maximize uh, uh, taxes and setting up rules and institutions in, 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 with the idea that, uh, of, of uh, maximizing tax revenue. Now this actually comes up in, uh, uh, in, in several ways in Buchanan's work. And one of the first papers that I found of Jim's uh, was part of this set of exchange with Warren Samuels in the early 70s. I really didn't have a sense of what the debate was about. I didn't go read Warren Samuels' 
paper of it, but I thought that Jim's analysis of the, the what was the Miller v. Shane case was just really, uh, really tremendous. That's a case in which uh, there are cedar trees growing in the neighborhood of apple trees, and the cedar trees develop a form of rust. Uh, a fungus or some kind, and uh, it is very benign with respect to cedar trees, but it turns out to be absolutely dis disastrous for apple trees. And so the apple tree owners uh, get together and lobby the uh, government uh, the, of the state, uh, which I now forget the state, uh, and they uh, uh, ask for a bill, legislation, allowing them to cut down the, tree, the, the cedar trees that are, co that are the source of this rust. And apparently the law is passed. But the broader issue had to do with different ways of thinking about the public sector. And I think part of the difference is, uh, as I look at it now, is because they start in very different places. So th this is uh, a series of papers in the law, uh, Journal of Law and Economics with uh, Samuels uh, publishing one in 1971, Jim with a reply in 72, and then they corresponded for much of a couple years about it, and then they published their correspondence uh, on that in July, uh, uh, in 1975. Uh, and then uh, uh, a number of years later, it looks like about 30, um, um, Pert and Levy uh, brought them together and uh, they had a conversation about this and Pert and Levy uh, 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 published it as part of a, this conversation as part of a, a book called The Street Porter and the Philosopher, a famous pair and discussion of Adam Smith's. Uh, and the like. And so Jim, of course, emphasized his con contractarian point of view. Samuels, Samuels emphasizes power, power and violence. And I want to interpret that through the lens of my recent work, that is, my book with Doug North and John Wallace called uh, Violence and Social Orders, and, and, and a paper that Gary Cox, Doug North, and I have on, on what we call the violence trap. Okay. So the basic idea is that countries with dispersed violence cannot sustain the rule of law. And I want to show you this, and this has a lot to do with, with why I think um, development is so difficult and, and why it is that the, the mix of ideas from Samuels and uh, uh, Buchanan are, are really important to think about together. Uh, a different kind of bifurcation than uh, Mike was talking about, but nonetheless one. So in the developed world, there's consolidated political control over the means of violence. We don't have separate armies. Uh, you know, uh, firms don't have their, their, their own armies. Uh, uh, there was a time when the United States did. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, Ford Motor Company had its own army, but that's another story. Uh, and, and a lot of the impediments to development, I think, come because of the nature of this dispersed violence. All right, so let's suppose Let's suppose that there's a powerful man. Uh, it, the logic kind of works like this. So there exists a uh, powerful man of sorts, uh, and he has many resources and many followers, and may not be the only one in that. And he kind of estimates that if he uses violence, he'll receive some value V. And so his choices really are using violence and, and attaining this value V, or cooperating with the state in some way, cooperating with other groups, often other like groups, in the state, and so the question is, which will he do? Well, obviously, it depends whether his expectation of cooperation is higher or lower than a, uh, than this value v. If it's if it's higher than than v, then he wants to cooperate. Um, so let's think about this in terms of a rule of law state, um, a, a state with, that has rule of law, but this man also has power. So the harmed man, the man that 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 was uh, the the uh, victim. Uh, wants to take this man to court, the powerful man to court, and suppose he does, suppose he takes him to court. Well, the powerful man has an army and he says, come get me. <laughs> I'm not going to court, I'm not participating in that. I will not acknowledge a judgment. And then what happens? <laughs> well, uh, it, it may be that other people want to fight him for this, but my, most of the time, other people that are powerful don't want to get involved. Why should they fight a war over, uh, with this guy over, um, over a problem with somebody that they probably don't even know? And so as a consequence, uh, there's corruption in the courts. The courts cannot act like courts. The courts, in fact, have to uh, uh, deviate from all the characteristics that are associated with the rule of law. Uh, in particular, impersonality, the idea that everybody's treated alike and anonymously in the rule of law. Well, here's somebody who, by virtue of his power, is not treated alike, is treated differently, uh, 
and that. And when this is a common thing, when violence is, is a prevalent thing in, in, in countries, then we see that court, it's very difficult to run courts because courts are very impersonal, uh, uh, where, whereas um, uh, people with violence make ru the rules very, very personal. Another very important thing about the way, way violence works is that in developing countries with, most, with multiple sources of violence, um, there, there comes to be the, those with violence have to be bought off. So remember that there was the powerful man thought, believed that if, there, that if he fought, he would receive V. Well, in order to keep peace in this society, in order to create some degree of cooperation, um, they, the society, the ruling coalition, has to give this man and his group something that's bigger than V. And that's true for all the other stakeholders who can start uh, viol violent, those with defer dispersed violence. And so part of what happens is they create rents. So I want to emphasize this is rent creation, not rent um, rent seeking. Rent seeking is a, much more of a demand side effect where interest groups are organized, they're powerful, and by virtue of their powerful organization, uh, they can demand things and the pol political system responds. This is a little different, related, but a little different. Rent creation is where the dominant coalition creates various kinds of restrictions, privileges, monopolies, cartels, and the like, so that the members of these uh, are distributed to those with violent power violence potential and therefore uh, give these people a reason to um, uh, give these people a reason to cooperate. Uh, but of course notice what that means about the structure of developing countries. Um, it means that they have all kinds of rent and privileges and uh, all kinds of regulations and markets. Well we've known that but notice it's a different mechanism. And economists come along and say, look, this is all in the way of efficient markets. You'll get rich if you create efficient markets. Get rid of this stuff. And what they think they're doing is by saying get rid of this stuff, we can move to a Pareto optimal world. Everybody can be better off uh, by a more efficient market. But what they're really saying in the context of violence is remove the mechanisms that keep peace. And that's one of the, the big reasons why I, I think that developing countries again and again and again fail to take reform programs designed by the World Bank and various forms of economists. <laughs> I thought I had a slide that had a... Uh, uh, so, so let me just end with one word on, you know, the direct connection between the form of government and economic performance. I mean, this was obviously a great concern uh, to Jim, and he clearly wanted to think about ways in, in, in which Pareto optimal moves could be made, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, the rules of the game uh, as well as the production of public goods. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and we're all in debt to him for having done so much of this analysis over the years that it's now become so many of these questions that he pioneered have become uh, uh, questions that we all ask in our everyday research. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's uh, an honor and a privilege to speak uh, uh, in this uh, podium after such a distinguished panelist, but most importantly to speak about uh, uh, Jim Buchanan. Uh, my only memory of him is that uh, I was uh, still uh, an undergraduate student uh, in Italy in 1986. Uh, in the summer of 1986, the Mont Pelerin Society met in San Vincent, and in spite of uh, the name, is actually an Italian city. And uh, I was a sort of member of the youth organization of a conservative party called uh, Liberal Party, liberal in the European sense, not in the American sense. And I was offered the opportunity to work uh, <coughs> as a staff member to the, to, to the, for the um, Montpellier Society meeting, um, and that gave me an opportunity to sort of sneak in the session and, and to meet uh, such uh, great people, including uh, Gene Buchanan. And uh, imagine my excitement when a few uh, months later he won the Nobel Prize, and uh, by now I live in Chicago, Nobel Prizes are in large supply, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> but, uh, at the time in Italy, the fact I could actually meet a Nobel Prize, so somebody that shortly afterward was a Nobel Prize winner, was a, a, a great excitement. And, and to the point that, that Mike was raising earlier, I was shocked, as, as a member of, of a conservative party, I was shocked that uh, uh, one of the friends and, uh, and, and good uh, uh, participant of the Mount Pelly Society was uh, 
a actually public uh, finance economist called Francesco Forte, I think he's still alive, um, uh, but member of the Socialist Party, or then Socialist Party was in government. So um, I was completely shocked that uh, Jim Buchanan and uh, many of the Montpellier Society were accepting somebody like, like him, but uh, uh, what Mike told us uh, uh, earlier, I think, is, is an indication of, uh, of, first of all, the open-mindedness of Jim Buchanan, but also the fact that uh, uh, being socialist in Italy sometimes was a necessity and not, and not a choice. Now, uh, the other thing why I'm sort of uh, very, very honored by that is that uh, uh, Jim Buchanan represents, uh, if you want, the continuity, the, the connection between an old uh, public finance Italian tradition that goes back to Matteo Pantaleoni, De Viti De Marco, and uh, at, at the end also uh, Luigi Gennaudi, uh, to sort of, uh, uh, of course, uh, the public choice in the United States and a resurgence of uh, uh, sort of political economy uh, in mainstream economic uh, uh, groups that uh, dates around the time that Buchanan won the Nobel Prize. And for matter was was driven mostly by Italian economists, from Alesina to Tabellini, and there's a long list uh, of Italian sounding and Italian names uh, that participated to this tradition, which I think is very much linked to uh, the history of uh, uh, our country, but also the fact that in some sense, Jim Buchanan um, helped in transitioning this uh, endowment of thoughts, making it uh, part of uh, the mainstream in, uh, in, in the United States. And even if uh, uh, in Cambridge uh, people might uh, treat with, so, with some condescendence Jim Buchanan, eventually his sort of contribution was important and recognized. And, and I think he's really helped uh, uh, making legitimate this very important uh, uh, field that today is, uh, is blossoming. Now, the only thing that uh, I find a little bit strange with my Italian perception is uh, the very optimistic, uh, in this respect, view of Buchanan. If you read uh, what uh, should economists do, he focuses, as sort of uh, people already said, on uh, the natural tendency of people uh, to barter, and he focuses on uh, uh, exchange as the crucial aspect of uh, every economic transaction, and uh, the, the desire to cooperate as, uh, uh, as a key force uh, that not only we should study, but also drives the economic uh, uh, arena, and to some extent, even the political world. Now, another uh, great of the past, or the recent past, Jackie Schleifer, um, classify and say there are two ways to look at the world. There is the Caucasian way, that you can say also the Jim Buchanan way, that is cooperation. And there is the Machiavellian way, which is uh, uh, man never, and man in particular is not uh, a sexist uh, classification because men are much worse than women in this, in this direction. Man never miss an opportunity to uh, cheat, steal, and take advantage on the other side. And, uh, and that's, in, in a way, the tension that we see in a lot of uh, economic literature and a lot of uh, uh, why we don't uh, talk to each other so, so easily is because the people that focus on the cheating, stealing, uh, and, uh, and aggression, and the violence that also um, uh, um, Barry was talking about, uh, are somehow uh, not talking to each other, not integrated sufficiently, the positive view, the cohesion view, the Buchanan view of integration and, uh, um, and cooperation, and never miss an opportunity to cooperate. And of course, both are true, and we need to live with both. And uh, I think you are, uh, history is quite important in determining where you fall into uh, these categories. If you uh, have been lucky enough to be raised and born in this country, you tend to have a more positive view of the world than if you're born in a lot of other countries around the world, and let's not name names, where uh, your perception is not as optimistic about the working of institutions, the working of cooperation, and so on and so forth. Now, the other point that uh, I thought was very important of, of Buchanan is, um, unlike Hayek and unlike uh, many um, members, uh, if you want, of uh, uh, the Montpellier Society, he actually understood the important, importance of institutions uh, to make markets work. So uh, the fact that uh, 
Mike was mentioning earlier, the, the price mechanism works. Uh, why, in aggregating information, why does it work? Because there is an institution surrounding uh, that that makes uh, the price work. If there is not this institution, uh, prices might not uh, work. Uh, I was mentioning this morning in, uh, in my lecture that um, one of the uh, more recent uh, uh, members of the Italian uh, public finance school, Luigi Enaudi, uh, his image of the market was an image of a country fair with two big policemen uh, at the entrance. The policemen were enforcing, uh, hopefully in an impartial way, the rules of the game. Without those policemen, then uh, uh, maybe that's a pessimistic Italian view, but without those policemen, uh, the, the trade breaks down and gets in, into violence. So you need to have uh, that enforcement for things to work. Now, the fundamental problem, uh, in my view, he, who has an interest in creating institution? Um, in some of the discussion we had earlier, we are saying there is this tension between exchange without a public good component and uh, issue that involves a public good. I think that's a false dichotomy, because in every exchange, there is a public good component. Why there is a public good component? Because the institutions that allow that exchange to take place is ultimately a public good. Uh, the tension that there is in, 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 a, in a competitive market system is that uh, in order to work, needs a set of institutions that make the system competitive and uh, the, the playing field level, but who has an interest in creating those uh, institutions? Who has an interest in making uh, the playing field really level uh, because a playing field at its real level benefits everybody a bit, but nobody in a disproportionate way. So there is not a natural constituency, there is not a natural lobby to defend a competitive market. The only way uh, to defend a competitive market is to appeal to the public at large. Uh, if everybody could get together and uh, they agree on impartial rules, that's what the, uh, we think, that's what the outcome will will uh, come out, but in reality we know that uh, even in the age of the internet where coordination is probably easier than it used to be, it's not that easy to create that community, it's not easy to bring everybody around the table, and small interest groups tend to be uh, much more uh, influential in shaping uh, the game, so the rules of the game are somewhat affected by who has the biggest uh, uh, seat at the table which tends also to be who has the most economic power. So there is a tendency of a distortion of rules in the favor of the largest players or the most political and economically influential players that, of course, tend to sort of uh, uh, um, increase their power, both politically and economically, thanks to this uh, distortion of the rules, and that tends to uh, go in, in a bad direction. So how do we get... Uh, that universality and impartiality that from Hayek to uh, more recently other political scientists indicate as fundamental in, in the market, I think that uh, they, you only have it through a involvement of a large group of people in uh, the, the, the political process. So in that sense, democracy is very important. But democracy is not enough because we've seen in a lot of countries with democracy, this does not take place. I think that uh, what is also important is a sort of a belief in the system, uh, that the system might work so that I'm not trying to undercut the system to begin with. So uh, my favorite example that I use all the time is, is uh, uh, what guarantees that you have an impartial system where people, for example, wait in line. Uh, waiting in line is not fun and uh, becomes intolerable when you see people cutting the line. Uh, intolerable because it's painful if you do it uh, even without other people cutting, but if other people cut, then you don't go ahead in the queue, you go behind in the queue. And so uh, pretty quickly, when you see enough people cutting the queue, even the most uh, low-paying citizens start to cut the queue. And then you can see in Italy, when you have the ski slopes, you see the Germans, that when they are in Germany, they sort of line up very properly. Once they come to Italy, they are the one who cut the lines more aggressively because <laughs> it's a free-for-all. So I think that uh, this demonstrates, in my view, the uh, fragility of the system and how important are those institutions and also those beliefs uh, that keep the system, uh, system together.
And, uh, and I fear that when uh, these institutions are um, weak or they are not uh, uh, strong enough, then the, the tendency on the one hand to sort of uh, uh, cut corners that in the world of uh, um, the economic system is to try to lobby the government to get advantage vis-a-vis -vis everybody else becomes not only sort of an option, become a necessity. It's like if you are in a place where everybody cut the line, you, you are sort of uh, inevitably forced to cut the line to survive. And, and that is what, uh, on the one hand, happens in, in, uh, when you don't have any impartiality rules. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the more you see the system being distorted by this line cutting, uh, the, more, the less consensus the free market system has and the more prone it is to people who come along and they say, no, no, we want to overrule the system, change the system, and uh, because uh, the way it is um, is not uh, working. And I think that uh, Jim Buchanan is not uh, alone, of course, there's Gordon Tallock, many others, but I think Jim Buchanan is very important in actually uh, bringing together uh, in the same set of analysis uh, the design of the political rules and the design of the rule of the game and the game itself. Uh, traditional economics uh, keep it separate and has kept it separate um, to, a, to a level that I think is almost embarrassing. And let me make an example, since I don't want to criticize others, let's start with Chicago itself. And let me make an example of how, um, in a sense, deep this disconnection was in the, the mainstream economics at the time. Um, I think that most of you know the famous piece by Milton Friedman in 1970 uh, on the New York Times, actually, magazine, saying that uh, the only social responsibility of business is to maximize profits. And uh, Milton Friedman is, is very clear in designing uh, the, this, his argument that this is true as long as the rules of the game are set. So he's saying that uh, the social responsibility of business is to maximize profits. The only social responsibility is to maximize profits as long as uh, you follow uh, given rules and regulation and you are in a competitive market system and you play without fraud and deception. Now, this was written in 1970, and his next-door neighbor in Chicago was actually George Stigler. And George Stigler, in 1971, writes a equally famous piece on regulatory capture, and where he says that regulation is designed not to benefit consumers, but is designed to actually benefit producers. Or even if it is born initially with some uh, very laudable intent of uh, benefiting consumers, what ends up doing uh, is benefiting uh, con um, producers, and uh, really going back to the famous sentence by uh, Adam Smith that uh, when producers get around the table, the first thing they talk about is how to restrict tra trade and basically how to screw their consumers. So I think that uh, this is not like a, a in a sense, uh, a, a stunning idea, but what is important is that Stigler makes it very clear that the rules of the game are not set up are not independent of the game itself, is that the very players that play the game actually go into the game and change the rules. So if you put together now Milton Friedman's sort of uh, indication and conclusion and Joe Stiegler, you have actually a puzzle. And uh, if you actually think about uh, modern corporations, uh, do they have a duty to maximize profits, also lobbying the government and changing the rule of the game to their own advantage? It seems like a contradiction in terms because uh, uh, you don't want to distort the rule of the game. We know from Gordon Tallock how sort of costly is rent seeking. And we know that uh, uh, in uh, uh, rent seeking, in the language of game theory, is, is something that uh, is very complementary. The more other people rent seek, the, the other, the more you want to rent seek. So uh, we don't want a citizen, we don't even want as investors to uh, push and motivate our companies to sort of uh, uh, lobby more to distort the game, the, the game more. But if you take literally uh, the maximized profits uh, individually for one company, actually modifying the rules of the game can increase profits. So 
Is there a duty to lobby? I don't think so. Is there, uh, is that right to ask uh, our sort of uh, companies, the companies we invest in, to lobby very aggressively uh, in the interest of uh, us as shareholders? I think that uh, I don't have the, the, the solution. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a little bit of advertising, but uh, in, in the beginning of March, we will have at Chicago a conference that uh, I call ironically Stiegler Metz meets uh, uh, Friedman, or actually Friedman meets Stiegler. Of course, they knew each other very well, they were colleagues. But uh, the fact that uh, the two universes, even if they are two colleagues, were so separate, indicates how important is the contribution on something, somebody like Jim Buchanan that really made a distinctive effort of bringing the two worlds together because there is a lot of things that we should learn in bringing them together, but also is because sometimes our view of the world, when we separate, we isolate one from the other, might end up leading in the wrong direction. Thank you. OK, that was great. Um, just on Luigi's last point, Milton Friedman famously said, privatize, privatize, privatize in 1979. And a few months before he uh, uh, passed away, he was asked a question, uh, Milton, would you uh, change anything that you said about your dictum? And he said, oh, yes, privatize, 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 provided there's a rule of law. <laughs> um, and so it was, uh, the, you know, he learned from that. Um, I, uh, do any of you want to make a reaction to each other first? Let's do that. Um, Maybe if I if I may, I, sure. I would love to discuss uh, what what Barry said because I think it's very important, and uh, I completely agree with him that uh, physical violence is important uh, and is a major obstacle of development in uh, um, many countries in the world. I don't want to say most countries in the world, but in many countries in the world. So it's something that uh, we need to study more and is important. However. Um, I want to invert uh, Clausewitz. Clausewitz said that uh, the war was a continuation of politics by other means. And I think that politics is a continuation of violence by other means. So uh, I'm not so sure that there is a discontinuity between violence and other uh, way of uh, uh, prevarication, intimidation, and, and et cetera, that can take place without necessarily uh, physical violence. So, um, in Greece, for example, and I talk about Greece because I don't want, only want to talk bad about my country, but uh, in, in Greece, <laughs> um, there are a few oligarchs that own the, all the major newspapers. And uh, every time somebody uh, is trying to somehow uh, criticize the oligarchs or introduce a piece of legislation that might actually change their position, uh, the newspapers start to attack this person very violently, uh, very often, uh, telling stories that are completely false, but you know, if you keep repeating something false enough, people may not, uh, end up believing it. Um, and, uh, and so this is clearly uh, violence to some extent, uh, is not really uh, physical violence, at least uh, might degenerate into that, but, uh, but it's not physical violence, it still is, is very important. And, uh, and then you keep going and then you realize that is more an issue of uh, uh, degree than, than rather than a zero one viable. Um, one of my favorite centers that does not make me very popular around Washington DC is that uh, there is a big contribution of Berlusconi to humankind. And this contribution is to make it so explicit, things that are a bit cover up in other countries and he made very clear, and so once you see them clearly, it's hard not to notice them when you see in other countries. What, what am I talking about? So Berlusconi uh, basically vertically integrated the government in the sense that he owned his member of parliament, where his employees, and he owned the ministries that were legislating laws uh, for his companies. So this is like, uh, speaking of privatization, that's a privatization of government vertically <laughs> integrated. Now, when you see that, then you realize, okay, now let's look at the United States. It's better, certainly, but um, Secretary of Treasury, they are not owned by a company, but they had to be employee of a company just a minute before and just a minute after 
they step down from being Secretary of Treasury. So they have the decency that for that one or two years in between, they're not exactly employee of that company. But is it so different? Uh, we know that there is a continuity between sort of supplier's and employees. Uh, so the Berlusconi version is more vertically integrated. Is, uh, but the United States Congress and, and, and government is not that different. So uh, I want to be sort of uh, a bit provocative here and say, Barry, you are right, but I think that there is a continuity. It's not there, are, there is violence in Mexico, and the United States is perfect. I'm certainly not going to defend that last sentence. Uh, absolutely. I think that this really is uh, one where there are discontinuities of this. You move slowly from one to the other. Uh, it's a problem we know very little about. That is, how do you get consolidated political control over the means of violence, uh, which, of course, is one of the criteria for, of Max Weber uh, in, in his de famous definition of a state. Um, one of the interesting things um, that you mentioned uh, having to do with uh, uh, Milton Friedman's famous article and, and, and the nature of the change of the dictum a, a, in, in his last year, um, I, I want to think about this as the neoclassical fallacy. And, and it's the idea that it's like this. Markets are independent of politics. Uh, and often there is a hand wave, say, just like in that Milton Friedman phase. Oh, yes, well, you need... In, enforcement of contracts and property rights and that sort of thing. And the neoclassical fallacy is, 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 can be seen in one of two ways. One is we don't have to state those conditions because it's all implicit in all of our work, uh, and so we don't state that. The other is, is when we do state that, we don't, we don't take the next step, which is, okay, if those are necessary, and without those you don't get markets, so those are necessary for markets, then we better study those too. <laughs> Okay, questions? Um, so we, we heard a lot about um, the importance of institutions in this panel, and I was wondering like, how that would connect with something uh, Professor Munger mentioned earlier, that it's a sort of challenge everything, but that doesn't mean everything goes. Uh, we were also talking about that you know, institutions need to be strong enough to provide the framework, that public good, that you know, framework for voluntary exchange. How do you strike the balance between having institutions that are strong enough to do that, but then still need to be questioned and poked and prodded? Well, the issue goes back to the calculus of consent, right? When they're talking about the trade-off between majority rule and unanimity. Un unanimity allows more liberty, people to protect themselves from owner's action, and yet it makes it very difficult to move ahead and adapt and change, you know, create new programs that are needed for new circumstances. And so I think that You've ra you raised another related trade-off that has exactly the same uh, uh, pluses and minuses. Um, I have a conceptual question to Professor Weingart, basically expanding on what you were trying to push, I think. So you were using the terms violence, coercion, and power. And I would be curious to get some more conceptual clarity of how you understand the terms, how you analytically try to separate them, but also how they might be related, because I think if we use them imprecisely, and I'm struggling with that in my own research, it gets quite a bit of a mess. Um, and this issue of continuity, zero, one, or not, <clears throat> really intrigues me. So how would you try to delineate power, coercion, and um, violence? That's a good question, and it's like corruption, you know, where people tend to think about corruption as one thing, but really there are multiple sources and multiple mechanisms of corruption. Uh, and I think that that's true also for violence, and we're just beginning to get a handle on these things. The way that I make sense of violence, per se, and, and I'm not going to give you a definition that tells us how to uh, distinguish coercion and other forms of violence, or violence-like, from, uh, uh, from, from violence uh, itself, violence potential. But the way we think about it is a bargaining game and a standard bargaining framework in which there's a, a, a there's a surplus to be divided. It's typically normalized to one. Each uh, of two parties, bargaining parties, have a, a, an option to fight. And if they fight, they win with probability. One wins with probability P, and the other wins with probability 1 minus P. If, uh, and and, and uh, 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 if they win, they win the entire surplus. Uh, and they each pay a different cost. Uh, they each bear a cost to fight. Uh, 
Uh, and so in that, in that world, you get a bargaining range uh, in, which, uh, it may, it, it's, in which it's better off not to fight. Uh, and that's the basic workhorse that we then use in several different kinds of circumstances and make, make, make the idea of violence, I think, much more, um, much more rigorous. Dave? Yeah, just to put that in historical perspective, the modern conception of corruption comes out of uh, early 1500s uh, England when agents of the king didn't actually have salaries. They would, uh, a fellow named uh, Samuel Pepys, I believe was his name, he controlled the, he was the person who, who uh, paid the sailors and he would say, okay, I can get to you three years and, oh, but I can get it to you in three days uh, for 10%. And that's how he made his living. There, there wasn't any salary. He worked on commission, and uh, basically uh, what he might have thought of as a commission was what we thought of as taking bribes and that sort of thing for, for selling a service that wasn't really his to sell. And you can imagine, like, at the time, it kind of made sense. Like, it, that actually was how he was expected to make a living, and that was expected to be his reason for doing it, and so that's a strange thing. And the concept came because um, uh, there were people who worked for the Pope, I guess, and they started writing uh, uh, writing diatribes about this guy and about the uh, corruption of the king. Mm -hmm. uh, corruption meaning it's rotten, it makes us want to barf. And they, they, so they, the cartoonists wrote about like people vomiting over how, uh, how corrupt this guy was. And that was, uh, that was the etymology of the word. And these folks replied, it's like, I'm sorry, you guys are selling like tickets to heaven and you're calling us corrupt? <laughs> um, and so, so the conversation goes back that far. And if you think about what it was like then, it's, uh, the institution was a little bit different, like, um, we don't, you know, the kinds of people who end up controlling the treasury and that kind of thing, that will, that really, I mean, it's a horrible thing, and maybe it's become business as usual, but it, but our co whole conception of corruption comes out of a time centuries ago when it really was business as usual, and there wasn't even an alternative. I thought, it, it, I'm sorry to say, but the definition of corruption is, is much older than that. Uh, Cicero, had a, a big uh, argument against uh, a, a guy, Vere, who was the governor of Sicily and was in charge of uh, collecting taxes there and was making a, a sort of a, a cut. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that was, uh, um, I think, it's probably as old as uh, Adam and Eve, uh, and, but was recognized yeah. much earlier. Yeah. Now, maybe that's the... Both of them cited Cicero. <laughs> Both sides cited yeah. Cicero. What do you mean by consolidated political power? And uh, your remark that violence is underappreciated um, you know, with regards to economic performance. I didn't hear all of the questions. I did hear you ask that you wanted a definition of consolidated political control of violence, but I didn't hear the rest of the question. Uh, uh, you remarked that violence is underappreciated with regards to economic performance. So I wanted to know what you meant by that. Did you mean violence uh, actually helps propel um, either directly or indirectly in uh, economic performance of nations? Um, if you mean that other people have worked on violence and I did not note them, that was a mistake on my part. Uh, there are, but it, it, my, my main point is, is it has not been integrated into the economics of development in a way that, mo mo uh, you know, just as a matter of course, models of developing countries take into account violence. Let me give you a fact about violence that's in the paper with Cox and North. Um, we we uh, have a sample of countries and we define a regime uh, as lasting uh, uh, as long as there's no violent takeover. So that leadership turnover is, uh, uh, is, is violent. When leadership turnover is peaceful, no matter what the regime does in the sense of constitutions, then the, then the regime uh, uh, continues. And so we have a data set, the Archigo data set that goes back to 1840, I believe, uh, and ask what the median value of, uh, what, what the median country in the world, uh, uh, how many years does it go uh, without violence? Anybody have a guess? Three. Three, any other guesses? 
Zero. <laughs> it's eight. So you're a little <laughs> off, but a little pessimistic. And if we look at the if we look at the the, the richest developing countries, the, the the figure is twelve and a half. So whereas if you look at the richest countries, the richest ten percent of the countries, it's sixty. So there's this immense discontinuity uh, uh, there, where, whereby. Uh, a big, it's not a linear difference in terms of violence in, ter in terms of uh, the poor countries. Uh, uh, more poor, poor countries are of a kind, which is part of what we argue in, 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 in my book with Doug and John. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, follow up on that real quick. I think that, um, you know, actually Luigi's uh, colleague, uh, Raghu Rajan, wrote four page little article that is one of the best ones ever written on this called Assume Anarchy. It was an IMF little paper. And it was basically the idea he was accusing what you call the neoclassical fallacy. He didn't use that phrase. But he just said, look, most economic analysis begins with uh, the assumption that we have well-defined and enforced property rights. In the worlds that we're studying, they don't have any mechanism to define or enforce these property rights by any kind of third party you know, payer or contractor, right? And so what we need to do, third party enforcer, sorry. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to assume that we're beginning in this world that you're talking about. And the question is, is how do we build up mechanisms to move from a world of violence into one where we can realize cooperation? So how do you get endogenous rule creation? And that, you know, there's, there's a, that's a big problem. That might explain you, you have only 10 or whatever is the number of countries that you said meet the, uh, the threshold of the institutions. I think you said 10 to 25 or something like that. But you think about it, it's kind of a fascinating puzzle, and it relates even to the regulatory environment. Because you know, if you remember this conference that you and I were at at the LSE, uh, Ann Kruger came up with a very you know, sensible phrase, right? She said, we, we don't like market romanticism or anything like that. We, what we need is we need reasonable regulation that's not capturable by interest. Sounds very nice. Now start doing any kind of, you know, study of this. And then you're like, well, maybe that's a null set. Now, that's a pessimistic view. OK, I'll admit that. Um, but you know, that would raise a whole set of hosts of questions to that. Um, and yet, that's a very hard thing to sort of get across in it. But I think the more we study endogenous rule formation um, and how it is that we can start, if we begin in the start state, not where everyone is already like cooperating, but instead one where they're in this um, you know, sort of state of violence, but then are able to build up rules that somehow constrain it, that actually makes us understand a little bit better what's going on in Africa or in these other kind of places. So, yeah. Yes? But to follow up with that, um, a lot has been said here about an um, even playing field, and I think one of the linchpins there is the rule of law, and how it might apply to everyone equally. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on some of the differing views as to even the possibility of truly a rule of law, you know, the myth of the rule of law by Professor John Hasness, for example. And if it is true that a political institution almost systemically cannot really develop, much less impose a rule of law, how does that play into uh, your viewpoint of this being a linchpin for everything else if we're looking at it through a political system as opposed to purely economics? I think it's certainly uh, something very difficult uh, to establish, but in, in some respects, um, in some dimension, this has been established in some countries, so uh, this gives us hope that the things can, can work. Um, again, I'm repeating myself for those uh, who heard this morning, but my my definition of the rule of law is the, is the following. Uh, last, no, two years ago, I, I testified in, uh, as an expert witness to the case of uh, uh, Star versus federal government. This was AIG or Greenberg suing the federal government, and uh, the stake was enormous, was 40 billion. And uh, it was not decided by a jury, it was decided by a single judge uh, here in Washington, D.C. And the night before I testified, I asked uh, the lawyers, I said, uh, what is the chances that you give to the event that uh, somebody from Treasury at some point will make a phone call or a visit and say, you know what, 40 billions are a lot of money, and uh, we don't want to pay them, so do something about it. 
And uh, they said, zero. And as an Italian, in Italy, I would say, one. <laughs> okay? Uh, not, not because necessarily the judge will listen to, but the fact that there will be some political pressure, uh, I give it for granted. Okay? And I have to say, maybe I'm a misbeliever, maybe there is like a sluggishness in expectation. As an Italian living in America, I still don't give a probability one, uh, probability zero, that in America this uh, might take place. However, this expectation is crucial because the reason why Greenberg spent a huge amount of money and uh, all the lawyers were involved, et cetera, and people were not using that money to try to use the political system but actually trying to win the battle in court is because there is that expectation. And so somehow uh, the United States succeeded in, in reaching this expectation, at least for a certain set of claims. I don't think that uh, for everything you can say this, and was not true uh, all the time. In a sense, uh, uh, if you want to go to the untouchable, you see that sort of uh, in Chicago in the, in the 30s and 20s, uh, the rule of law was not really enforced even against criminals, so let alone with other people. So it's not something easy, uh, but uh, it is possible, and there is a huge uh, demand from the public at large. So if we all sit down around the table, I repeat myself, if we all sit down around the table, that's what we want. Now, how to go and implement that, that's where sort of Barry and others have written a lot and is, is not an easy step, but this is what we should keep in mind. Chris? Uh, thank you all very Thank you all very much for the uh, comments. I appreciated them. Uh, I have a question about institutions and public goods. And so one of the standard kind of arguments or justifications for government is the provision of public goods because left to their own devices, private individuals can't provide enough of them, whether it's national defense or more productive, what Buchanan called productive public goods. If good institutions, market institutions, government institutions, and so on, are public goods, uh, and the maintenance of those institutions require belief systems and so on that contribute to those public goods, uh, doesn't that create a fundamental tension? Uh, which is that private individuals left to their own devices can at least in principle uh, create significant or provide significant public goods, uh, at a minimum uh, a government, a constrained government to provide subsequent public goods? Uh, I completely agree there is a tension. Uh, I think that the way I try to resolve this tension is by uh, postulating, but I think it's relatively reasonable, that uh, we all have, uh, not all, but most of us have a little of a social element in ourselves. It says, if you take the, the view of the world that uh, we are only interested in our own self-interest, very narrowly defined, then there is no hope, because then you go straight to uh, the rational ignorance part of the fact, why do we vote, uh, the fact, and uh, I think there is no hope of solving the problem. And uh, I think that not only sort of to solve the problem, but also because uh, in my view is uh, what present reality is that most of us are willing to sort of uh, contribute a little bit to the public good. Uh, most of us go to vote even if we know we're not pivotal. Most of us uh, contribute to charity even, all of that. So good institutions are the one that can lever a small amount of uh, social contribution by a lot of individuals into something good, okay? Because while I believe that most of us have a little element, there are very few people that are social heroes. And those are in short supply, and uh, I don't know who said it, but uh, thank to the world in which you don't need heroes. So a, good, a world with good institution is a world that doesn't need those kind of heroes because they're in short supply. I think that's interesting, and I, I certainly believe what you say, and Adam Smith has a variant on how to think about that. The problem is, is that how do you make it operational? Okay, so here it is. It's people feel, are going to feel differently on different elements, uh, uh, different, di in different domains, they're going to feel different amounts of this. And so how are you going to make this non-tautological? Well, here's a domain where we see a lot of this, therefore it works, so therefore it, people must have had this kind of feeling, uh, you know, and you're working backwards, building the theory into your explanation, building the hypothesis into the explanation. No, no I, I think that uh, you can see from a practical point of view, so most people uh, read some level of 
most people maybe it's too much, but a lot of people get some level of information, okay? And not information, uh, um, news you can use, that stuff is self-interested, but uh, for whatever reason, we all uh, are interested a little bit in uh, um, regulation doesn't affect us deeply, okay? So uh, now, in a, in a world in which regulation, for example, is forced to be simple at the cost of being economically inefficient, it's much easier for informed public to have an opinion about whether regulation is good or, or bad and support it. Uh, the moment you make regulation very complicated, uh, most people's eyes glo glaze over, including mine. And it's as if no nobody, I think, in his right mind has ever read the entire Dodd Frank, okay? Uh, <laughs> Probably not even Dodd Frank himself. It's, it's like Obamacare. Uh, so. Yeah, exactly. Actually, in Obamacare is even more interesting because Nancy Pelosi said when he passed it, when she passed it, they said uh, we need to pass it to know what is in it. Mm -hmm. So she actually admitted that she never read it. So I think that uh, this is, in a sense, is the tension. And good institutions are the one in which you make it simpler for people to have an input. Uh, and uh, but for this to work, you need to have a competitive media market, you need to have a lot of things along the way. I, I agree. Okay, I think, unfortunately, we're, we're at the very end of our time. Um, it's good that we end up with questions and, and examinations. Um, so at this point, I would like to uh, uh, first thank uh, my colleagues uh, at Mercatus, and especially Claire Morgan, uh, for all the hard work they did in organizing. <laughs> and, uh, we have a, a wonderful staff here um, at Mercatus and the Hayek program, and uh, they do a phenomenal job on all these events. Um, I also would like to, once again, gratefully acknowledge the financial support of the foundations that are listed in the back of your program, especially the Templeton Foundation, uh, without whose support none of these programs we run would, would be possible. And uh, finally, I, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Mike and our panelists, uh, for their time and their insight. So um, thank you. And uh, as Jim Buchanan would say, onward and upward. So thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the F.A. Hayek program, visit ppe.mercatus.org.